Hi everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events and today is one of such events. If you want to find out more about the events we have, there is a link in the description. Go there, check it out and you'll see all the events we have in our pipeline. Then, important, do not forget if you want to see amazing streams like we have today, do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and we have an amazing Slack community. If you join it, you can hang out with other data enthusiasts. During today's interview, you can ask any question you want. There is a link, pinned link in the live chat. Go there, click on that link and ask your questions and we will be covering these questions during the interview. That's all the introduction I have. I'm stopping sharing my screen. Then I open the questions we prepared for you. Um, just one second. Yeah, I'm ready. Oops. Uh, meanwhile, I can see that people are asking how long it will take. Uh, I assume how long it will take the stream to to end. Any ideas? One hour. One hour. Okay. Yeah. It uh, depends on how many questions we will have in the chat, yeah. right? We, we, we can't leave uh, questions being unanswered. Um, can we? Kind of we can. <laughs> depends All on right. the, the amount of questions, right? And depends on uh, how it goes with us. Because anyways, we just start and then we see how it goes. If you have some time in addition to the hour we planned, that's cool. We can spend okay. some more time, but we should be getting started. Alex, it's always oh. a pleasure to hang out with you, so I always have an extra time. Yeah, uh, that's very nice to hear. So this week we'll talk about why machine learning design is broken. It's a very provocative topic and we have a spe very special guest today to talk about that, Valery. It's not the first time we have Valery in this podcast. Some time ago I already had the pleasure of speaking with Valery and it was also about ML system design. I think it was one or one and a half years ago, some time ago. Yeah, I think yeah. it was a year ago, something like that. Ago. But uh, I mean, maybe you're right. Uh, time flies. Time flies. Yeah. Time so flies. for those who don't know anything about Valeri yet, he is the VP of Data Science and Blockchain, where he is responsible for leading the company's data-driven initiatives. Before that, before to, uh, before joining blockchain, he worked at different leading tech companies like Facebook, Alibaba, X5 Retail Group. So welcome again, welcome back to our podcast. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, by the way, I, I'm actually joining a new company uh, pretty soon. I haven't yet disclosed the name of the company, so it remains a mystery, uh, but will be a significant shift uh, in, in the industry. But maybe it will be a reason for you to invite me for a third time, right? Who knows? Yeah, of course, of course. So yeah, have fun at your new place. And uh, yeah, so before we go into our main topic of ML system design and why it's broken, let's start with your background. So for those who did not hear the previous interview, uh, maybe you can briefly walk us through the career journey you had so far. All right. Uh, well. It's not an easy question because it depends how, how, how deep we want to dig. Not so deep uh, because we yeah. want to talk about ML design, right? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay, let, 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 let's focus on why I think I am the person who can talk about machine learning system design. Uh, as you already mentioned, I worked in uh, many different companies. Uh, most of them are quite prominent, uh, Alibaba, Facebook, or company for, company formerly known as Facebook, uh, known as Meta at the moment, um, blockchain.com, X5 retail group. So uh, I was leading both uh, smallish, like 10, 20, 40 people teams, and bigish, like 100, 200 people teams in different countries, in different industries, but my area was almost always the same. It was data analytics and machine learning. Um, and, and data and software engineering, computer science, but uh, 
I'd, I'd say that uh, probably machine learning is my is my forte, and uh, I've seen uh, many uh, different projects uh, succeeded and failed for various of reasons, and that's why I and a friend of mine, Arsini, we decided to write a book, uh, which all you can buy, by the way. Uh, it is called Machine Learning System Design uh, with end-to-end examples. And to be honest, I didn't know the name of the book by the very end because a uh, publisher uh, was pushing the cha change of the title. The original title was Principles of Machine Learning System Design. Uh, so I was writing the book, which name, uh, which title I didn't know. And uh, this book basically is a meta document. Uh, well, a person from the, the person who worked on, at Meta, which document this person, which book this person could write? Of course, a Meta book, a Meta document. And uh, this document describes and tells you how to tackle the problem of uh, system machine learning system design uh, from a, let's say, from a manual uh, or like. Um, instruction point of view so like what are the chapters uh, what are the milestones what are the cornerstones what do you have to cover what do you have to think about and how to create the single coherent uh, and easy to understand document which will help you to to succeed and, and to be honest i was thinking why do we do machine learning machine learning design documents and uh, the provocative and you probably already met, noticed that i like provocative titles would be that the goal of machine learning system design uh document is for your project to fail what to fail to, to fail as soon as possible, because it's much better for your project to fail if you invested two or three weeks than if you invested six or nine months. So you probably do want to know before than after, right? If you think about that, let, let's say, let's say uh, doing the design doc either increases the chances of your project to succeed or you know that it will fail six months prior to that. That makes sense, right? If you know something six months prior to that, that makes sense. But uh, you asked me for introduction. I already started to, to, to go by the so, uh, I'm la, a bit la, 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 <laughs> Maybe we let's start here. should take a step back. Uh, and uh, so you already said that you're writing a book and the book is about ML system design and the goal of the book and in general, when we create a machine learning system before we actually start working on this actively with implementing and getting data and all that, we need to create an easy to understand document, a meta document about, um, I don't know, about the system we want to create, right? So this is an easy to understand document that is uh, coherent, that is not so big maybe. And then you said that the goal of this document is, to make project fail as soon as possible. And this is when I got confused. So, okay, we okay. have this document. <laughs> okay, okay, let, 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 let's, let's try to, to, to clear that. Uh, when you do machine learning project, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like, well, well that, that obviously depends what do you do, but if you think about that, software projects are not, well, they're relat relatively deterministic. Like you can estimate how long would it take to complete something, uh, whom do you need for the team, etc. However, even for software in engineering projects, it's it's like nine out of ten times you would find out that you actually spent uh, hundred percent more time, and you needed like uh, twice as many people as you thought at the very beginning. And those are very, very, let's say not very, but much easier to estimate projects compared to machine learning projects. Because machine learning projects at the very beginning, they're less, they're much more stochastic. You, you don't know what exactly would you expect. I mean, of course, if it's like a recommended system, you've done 10 recommended systems in the same domain, it's like 11 recommended system, you might say you have some understanding what to expect. 
But what I'm saying is that uh, in in machine learning, uh, the the amount of things which might affect the outcome uh, severely is much higher than in any other projects. Now, uh, what is an idea of design doc? If you think about that, it, it is ridiculous to imagine uh, the crew of the constructors creating a building without a blueprint, right? Let's say, let's say, a hundred constructors gathered and decided, okay, let, guys, let's build a school. Okay, and they just started to dig, uh, laying out the uh, foundational work, etc., without any blueprints. That, that you can't imagine that, right? Like that's that's impossible. Like nobody will give them any permission to do that. Nobody would give them anything to do until they have a proper blueprint. Now, you you worked in many different companies, right? You have a plenty of experience, Alex. I have a question for you. How many times you've seen a project, project being started without a proper design documentation? Like let's say out of 10 times, how many times would you see the project without a proper design documentation? Well, if I'm being honest, like nine and a half. Nine and a half, right. Crazy, right? It, 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 yeah. Isn't that crazy? No. It depends when people... like what you mean by a proper document but sometimes well, yeah, projects will start without any document whatsoever yeah let, let's say if you don't have any document documentation surely you don't have a proper documentation like 100 <laughs> percent yeah uh, but but you see like right nine and a half out of ten let, or maybe eight whatever but it's like a majority yeah. which yeah. is ridiculous so uh, and when i'm saying that the goal of design doc to fail imagine every time there is a building to be constructed uh, people, uh, engineers, architects, they conduct some calculations. Like, is it feasible to do? Let's say someone will come to you and tell, hey, guys, I want 10 kilometers tall building, uh, right? And, and then they'll they'll try to outline that. They'll, they'll try to do the blueprint. I'll tell you, sorry, we can't do that. That's impossible. It is much better to find out on the blueprint stage than right after you already built like 500 meters and then you said oh by the way we can't do that mm -hmm. so in, in, in that in that case if you if you have a proper documentation and you outline all the most of the things corner cases etc you already have information which will help you to understand if a can we do that right and in that sense the goal is to fail because you want to understand that this is impossible before you invested too much time, efforts, resources, whatever. But if it's not impossible, if it's, let's say, you don't need a 10 kilometers high building, uh, if you need a school, but you probably still would like to have a, a blueprint of the school because my idea of school, your idea of school, it's still a school, right? It might be very different. What does this this school need? Like, uh, so that, that that that's what design document tries to to outline to solve. What do we want to have at the end? What do we need to have at the end? Right? You see, there is a difference between want and need. And can we can we have it or not? So uh, th that's the thing because the situation uh, both I and apparently based on what you just told me you saw in the industry is like uh, it's, it's absurd. Uh, people are trying to build an extremely complex solutions uh, without the proper without laying the proper groundwork. Yeah. So. One of the goals of the design document is to think of all the possible ways that how it can go wrong, right? So you just think, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what I need to do. Like these two things are already quite difficult. And then you think, okay, in order to achieve that, in order to build that, we need to do this, this, and this. And what can go wrong when we try to do this? Okay, maybe the data is missing, right? Or maybe like uh, there is a like a lot of traffic comes in and then, I don't know, our system breaks, things like that, right? Yes, I, I'd say so. Uh, not only what can go wrong, but also based on our decision on the early stage, it, it definitely affects the next stage, right? Let, let, let's say, let's say, again, let's take the analogy of uh, building uh, 
um, a school. If you need a five-story school or 50-story school, I, I don't, I, I, I never seen 50-story schools, but you probably need a very different things to be done at the very beginning, right? You probably need a very different fundamentals for this school. The same goes for machine learning. Let's say uh, if it's if it's a real-time system or if it's a batch processing system, which you might decide at the very beginning, it might really affect uh, the outcome and what, what do you need. So it's not only the problems, it's only uh, the, the possible, let's say, uh, split criteria. But another thing is that, uh, like, as a, as, a, as a single person or even a small team, it's very hard to to think about everything. Again, depends on your experience and how typical the project is. But the good thing is that if you have some kind of ideal blueprint in your head, it is very hard to share it with other people. Like you can even come to other people, look into their eyes, they still can't download it from your uh, from your head, right? It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Maybe Elon Musk and, and his technology, and, uh, Neuralink will solve it, but you can't do that. So that's why we had to upload uh, this information on, on the paper, on digital paper, or like a, a Google Doc. And then you can share it with many different people. And uh, so let's even forget about that. You The, the vision you, you have on the day one and the vision you might have on day hundred, you might think they are the same, but you might you might have forgotten some some stuff. And 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 if you, imagine you have now three people on the team, are you sure you have the same vision if it's all in your head, right? So how how, how synchronized are you? I don't think you are very much synchronized. So uh, so having that on the paper, uh, it, it helps you to a remember, b outline, c share with other people who will provide a feedback. Uh, and there are many different ways, uh, there are many different possible feedback from A. Actually, guys, you don't need the ML system to do that, which is the best because like, you know, the best code, the code which, which is never written or write a, a, as less code as possible. Uh, so the same applies to the systems. If you can do something simple, do something very simple. Uh, if statement is always better than linear regression, linear regression is always better than nonlinear model. Nonlinear model, uh, like a boosting, is uh, usually better than uh, neural network, etc. Et so if it's simple, it's good. Uh, but then, um, uh, the, yeah, the last thing, yeah, you 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 can receive all this uh, feedback from from the people, and they can uh, highlight the things you could miss. And also, if you think about that, you could. If you've done that and you have this culture in the company, that means you could also read other people docs and enhance and widen your experience by at least reading it. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's really great. And one of the things that you mentioned was that we have a we want to have a shareable document where we write what we need and what we want and these are different things and i think this is one of the like, common challenges or that we have when we actually design a system right because in advance we don't always know what we need we only know what we want to have and these things could be different and maybe i wanted to talk a bit more about these differences and in general the common challenges that we have in addition to that when building systems well, you you have a well of experience, and you know that the hardest one of the hardest thing is to maintain, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let, let's say that you could say, "Oh, I need to do things right. I will create a proper document." And let's say you've done that. On the next day, the document you created is an obsolete. It's outdated <laughs> because you might. Oh, we need actually we need to change something. Or actually, that's that's not what we needed. Actually, we had a new input. And then a week later, a month later, six months later, you would see the document and the reality diverge. Mm -hmm. And so it is it is very hard to maintain the document. 
right? Because oh no, like I'll do that late. I'll just it, it's a small thing. I won't I I won't put that into the document because that that's what you said is hundred percent right. It all oh, life will change. Software is never done. That's why you still have uh, uh, tens of thousands of people working at Facebook, at Google, etc. You might say, yeah, but Facebook is already already exists as an app, right? W what what do these people do? Or like Google, it's already ex it already exists as a search. But no, you you always need to have a people, right? And obviously, if you think about product like Google Search, and probably it had a design doc. How many times it it, it, it had been updated? Uh, many, <laughs> and probably still uh, it has been updating still. Yeah. So that's why it's you have to keep your design doc. Design doc is a living thing, and uh, this is actually if we come back to the original title, while design is is broken, because people think about design doc as just some like artifact, right? Okay, it's done. Let's mark the box and go to the next stage it is never done it's it's never done because system is constantly uh, changing so the one thing which is broken is that even if people prepare the documentation which we already discussed with you is a very rare thing like very rare already it it, it is it, it becomes outdated pretty soon if it's not a living thing but I mean, so I remember when I was working at uh, Yandex uh, and Yandex Advisor, the, the one thing I was astonished is the quality of documentation. The documentation there was extremely good and well. So, and instead of um, taking others people, well, technically you can use a, a verb molesting but now molesting has a different uh, context so probably it's but you still can use like if you're noisy or taking someone's time yes yeah, so i no, I've, no I've, use the, the, the well you, technically if, if you take a look in the dictionary you can you can still use molesting like oh i molested my co-workers like i i took all um, a lot of their time <laughs> and like i was noisy but yeah so it's probably uh my credit so yeah uh we need to count this but i'm not a native native speaker right uh Anyway, so you, you're taking you're taking the time of your co-workers. You are, um, let's say, spending a lot of your time. You're spending a lot of time of doing no, no proper thing. Instead of which, you can just go read 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 the docs, and that's perfect, right? That that, that works. That, that, that's actually why Stack Overflow. Or stack overflow is, is such a great thing which is basically uh, to some extent it's not a, a living doc right but it's basically you can go there you can find the answer for your questions you leave it immediately everything is good yeah i just i just checked the dictionary you can use a molest uh like if you just uh, noise you're trying to get like information from from someone and like, like stop stop doing that so yeah very good at the tasking yeah <laughs> i have to um but anyway um, that, that's a problem that we don't do that and that's why it's broken we, we we don't we don't maintain we think oh it's done however to some extent it's a design document it's like a code a code is never done code is never finished the same applies for a design document it's never finished uh we which which is in in in, in that in this sense it is very different to the blueprints Right, you probably won't expect the blueprints of the building to change over the time. I mean, I mean, you might have some additions, right? But usually, they they remain the same. I hopefully so. Like, if it changes like midway through the building, like it's already half done, and then ah, oh, by the way, we decided to go to add thirty more stores, thirty more levels. Like, hey, surprise! Yeah, let's let's do that. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Actually, now it's not a school; it's not a helicopter park. What is a helicopter park? Doesn't matter. Now it's a helicopter park. Yeah, good that we work in the software industry, right? Maybe. Uh, you, 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 yeah, that, 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 that's a, that's like a reason. If I summarize one of the reasons why machine learning design document might fail or why a project might fail is that we assume that the design document is a static thing. So we finished it and it's 
not going to change. While it's actually a dynamic thing, it's changing like code, it's never done, it's never finished, it requires maintenance, cause requirements change, life changes, things will be different tomorrow, right? And we need to account for these things and we need to go back to our document and update some things. And what, right. are, yeah, what are the consequences for that? Like, let's say we're working on a project, we have a design document, we already started implementing this and then the new piece of requirement comes and then we need to update the document, what, what happens? So here's the problem for that. It's very hard to imagine one person working throughout the, the whole system, especially if it's a big project. Let, let's say it's a, if it's a one project, it's a one person project. Well, probably you even don't need, well, I'd say you still need a document, but it's a different thing. However, if it's a, a teamwork, uh, that means you probably have a different people responsible for different things. Um, and again, I will appeal to your experience. Uh, have you ever noticed that, let's say, if you have 10 people team, every person in this team might have a slightly different or very different understanding on who is responsible for what? Quite often. Most of the time, yeah. Quite, Unless quite often. explicitly written somewhere. Right. That's exactly the case. Unless it's explicitly written. So first question, it has to be written somewhere, right? Like uh, person A, Alice is responsible for this. Uh, person B or Bob is responsible for that, etc. You probably would like to have some overlap because you don't want only one person. Like you don't want to have a bus factor being equal to one. Uh, but why not to have a design doc as a place of like uh, accountability and areas of responsibility? Now, as soon as you know who is accountable for what, who owns what, uh, those people are now responsible for updating uh, their part of the document, which makes sense, right? Because they know they're, they're part of the system the best. Uh, probably nobody else knows it better than them. And as soon as there is something new, which might pop up quite often, they go to the doc, they update it. Uh, sometimes it's also nice to notify other people that, oh, I, by the way, there are uh, a new change coming. Uh, and now it's much more feasible than having one person uh, running around the 10 different team members or sometimes 10 different teams, right? Because, well, again, it depends how big uh, is the project. Sometimes the project might be really big. So you might have 10 people, you might have uh, 10 teams, you might have 10 teams with uh, 100 people each, with 10 sub teams each. Now, so you probably would like to, to have this uh, accountability, uh, ownership, and then those people uh, in, uh, let's say, distributed way can maintain the document. Because otherwise, it's, it's very hard to have, it's almost impossible to have a keeper. Maybe you can hire a, a full-time job person whose goal will be to keep the document updated and living thing. Uh, but I, I still don't think, it, it, well, we usually call these people project managers, right? Or yeah, <laughs> so, project managers sometimes. No, I, I'd say no, product is like for a product. For, for, yeah, yeah, like uh, whatever. Sometimes it's their responsibility. So like when a team does not have a project manager, then somebody needs to write it. And it's like, a, I don't know, a lead uh, or a project manager or engineering manager. Somebody has to do this, right? Uh, like to your point, it's um, like it's there is not always a person whose full time job is only that. Like there is, there is never a person who's full. Never. I never seen that. Never. I think I remember in, when I worked at uh, one of the companies, it was quite some time ago, there was actually a person responsible for documentation only, but it was uh, customer facing documentation. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, that's, uh, that, that makes sense, but that's a bit different, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's different. That's very, very different. So it's very hard for me to imagine. Well, I mean, if, if it does make some sense. Uh, because it's always, you know, I've been thinking about that for, for, for a while. There is always um, an equilibrium, a balance 
uh, between efficiency and redundancy. Obviously, having a person whose full-time job is only maintaining and keeping the documentation seems like a thing which not every company can afford. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't look like a very efficient way of spending your money. On the other hand, if you need a redundancy, and you know, right, there is always redundancy or efficiency, like... Uh, uh, if you build a system which has to be reliable, you probably think about a lot of redundancy because uh, if one machine will go down, you don't want the whole system to go down. So that's why you'd like something to be double checked and uh, be in abundance. So, but it's it's always the, the the question is what is more important for your efficiency or redundancy? Okay, so that's again uh, that that's I guess another reason why or another kind of uh, challenge or flaw that we have in the machine learning system design practice is that we don't have accountability included in the design doc. We don't know who is doing what, right? And then if we don't have that, then who is going to maintain different parts of the system or different parts of the design document? And that's another reason why things might go wrong because there's a change maybe and nobody documents this change. People just talk about this on a meeting on a daily saying, hey, like there is a, a piece of feedback coming from customer and then we need to account for that. We need to do something. And then somebody says, okay, I'll just go do, and fi do a fix, a workaround. I'll fix that thing, but it does not update. It doesn't get updated in the documentation, right? And then we have a problem. And then a solution to that would be the person who is responsible for that area makes sure that like the code and the documentation are kept in sync, right? So they are synchronized. Uh, so you probably have heard about this horror story from a Twitter. They recently were bought by the extravaganza billionaire who I decided that the that. best idea, to, yeah, that's the best idea is to lay off most of your engineers. Which is okay, which is okay because Twitter was very well known, was notorious for being a place where you can uh, chill out and not to work at all. However, the, uh, the thing is that two weeks later, they had to rehire hundreds of those people because it turned out that some of these people were irreplaceable. Well, it's, it's not like people are replaceable. It depends how many people you have with a given uh, set of knowledge, right? Uh, which is basically a bus factor. How many people have to be in the bus or have been like in a car accident uh, for your project to close? So if you, if you have this accountability written in the document, you, it's very easy for you to understand what are your choking points? What are the bottlenecks? What are the risk areas? Let, let's say <clears throat> you'll find out that there is only one person who knows about A, B, and C in your system. That's probably not the, the thing you'd like to have, right? How often does it and like also in practice? Like, sorry for interrupting. Okay. I think, like, what you say makes total sense, but I'm just wondering how often does it actually get implemented, like how often you can open a document and see, okay, we have a, these risk areas, like this part of the project depends only on this person. Okay. We I tell you what, it, it is, every proper engineering manager implements that at least in their heads. Okay. Because they want to understand a lot because like they, they need to appreciate the possibility of some people living mm -hmm. or not performing like how fragile their project is. Now I have an idea for startup. Uh, I'll tell you. So the startup is like no layoffs.com or .ai, already, uh, already proposed the name. So how it works. You create the design doc, right? And this design doc, you'd like to have uh, uh, people, a list of people accountable for specific areas. And you know that you have to have at least one person or probably two, right? Now, you, you try to make a combination so to have a maximum amount of people being only one or two 
in these areas so you can't lay them off because you, you understand, right? Because let's say if you have three people, let's say you have six areas or, 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 or let's say uh, three areas and three people and each person knows every area, right? So that means that your boss factor is three. You basically can fire one person, right? You still have two people knowing each area. But instead of that, now imagine one person knows only one area. Now suddenly your boss factor is one and you can't fire anyone. So this startup will provide you a design doc um, assigning, allocating people to specific areas so you can't fire them. That's like an idea I, I just give to the world. Do you need a, actually a startup for that? Because you can just assign a single person to a topic. Yeah, uh, if they can do that, you would be surprised how bad how bad are people with combinatorics. Uh, okay. You you know, I, you know there is like a tra tra travel salesman's problem, uh, right? Which is a very well studied problem in uh, how you say discrete math. And there are some people who just created the libraries and they sell them for money for companies which need this kind of optimization because they can just do that better. So mm -hmm. how much are you willing to pay to, for, not, for being sure that you won't be laid off? <laughs> this is a very good startup idea. Think about it. Yeah. So I guess the main idea here is you want to be redundant, uh, like you want to have multiple people knowing at least multiple areas. Right, but then yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's it's like it's like a fire anyone. It's like a toolbar, right? Like, uh, what do you want? Efficiency or redundancy? Obviously, probably if it's like a critical component, you'd like to have more redundancy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So it's always um, a trade-off. Okay. Um, so I think here one of the things we talked about quite extensively here is that things change, life will change, and we need to account for that. And our design document does not need to be, it has to be non-static, it has to be a dynamic thing. So how do, do we build, how do we design a machine learning system in such a way that it's lean, it's maintainable, it's extensible? When a new piece of requirement comes, we can actually go there, we know who owns it, and then this person can just go and update it. Like how do we do this? So the answer is very simple, right? You go, you buy our book, uh, you have a, a design doc outline as an example for two different things. Probably later we will create a course which people can buy and uh, learn how to do that. However, the answer uh, for that, if you, well, obviously you'd like to, to, to do incorporate the meaningful things into your design, right? You, you might want to have chapters. You, you'd like to have a, uh, modular structure, uh, mo module number one, module number two, module number three. So like uh, uh, if something is adding, it's not a monolith. It is just another module you can add. And then you know who, again, who is responsible for what. And nobody prevents you from even writing a specific test to see what does the last time specific chapter was updated. And I, I have some, some kind of alarms. Uh, maybe well again it depends on how how far how far you'd like to go uh because well you know that you can link uh tickets uh in jira for example or any other task tracker and your github or whatever you have as a code uh version control system uh they say it might be done because actually the, like as any meta document you you can do whatever you want but you can reuse a piece of code you 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 can see let's say if you know that the last time the code for this chapter was updated was a, a week ago, but the last time the chapter was updated was a year ago, something is wrong. Right, right. But you see, it's, it, it, again, it always depends how, how, how important that's, that's for you. Basically, what I prefer is just to have a clear structure, a clear outline of design doc, uh, the design doc being split by chapters. Each chapter or sub chapter, uh, has its owner, or maintainer, or person accountable for that, and uh, and and then you you have a list of people working on the project. What areas do they cover, and what is the coverage factor for each area? Like how many people can cover the specific area? 
And the, the, one of the most important one of one of the most important thing is that you know in some companies, uh, for engineers they review how many uh, diffs, how many PR. Well, we we call them diffs in uh, in Meta or pull requests. You probably call them usually how many uh, code changes the person has done, the engineer has done. Right? Sometimes that's a metric. I think that another important metric is how many times the design doc has been updated. If this metric will be incorporated, uh, basically, if you have an engineering excellency <laughs> as your performance review acts, uh, that makes sense to incorporate uh, the design doc there as well, because what usually is incorporated is uh, code diffs, code reviews, right? But, but if you think about that, design doc reviews are even, well, it's hard to say more important, right? Because it's, it's very hard to assess what is more important, but they are also at very important. important. Well, because like hard it to say. The entire system. Yeah, it impacts the, the full system. But again, you can't say, oh, I've dated like uh, three, three lines. It is 10 times more impactful than like uh, yeah. actual code, which is doing that. So you, you, you see, it's, you, you, yeah. you, let's say as soon as metrics becomes a goal, it mm -hmm. ceased to be a good metric. Mm -hmm. But we, we need to incorporate something like that in the performance review because as soon as it incorporated, people will start chasing it. But if they, they have to have some incentive to do that. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is in order to be able to maintain our documents uh, in a good shape and in order to make them extensible, it's not enough to just have a clear structure we also need to give a bit of an extra incentive to people to do that. For example, uh, make sure that their performance review depends on how good they do this. Which is good because, you know, because if, if you only have a code, that's only a part of the job, right? And you know that in some companies, they don't even do proper code review, which is bad. And so, and people try to go, oh, how, how can we incorporate that? How can we work on that? So like code reviews, Makes sense, right? Nobody asks, oh, why do we spend time and extra efforts on code review? So you do that to check if the code is correct, to increase your bus factor, right? Because you want to have more people have at least some knowledge of the code base. Why doesn't that, the same applies for a design. Actually, it doesn't matter if it's machine learning system design or just a system design. You'd like as many people being there as you could, knowing and working on that. It also gives them an extra, let's say, opportunity for growth. Okay, and we have a question that is quite on topic to what we discussed. The question okay. is, is there a universal template of a machine learning system design document? And I think it's related because you mentioned that a design document should be modular. So there should be chapters. Uh, it should follow a clear structure. So maybe you could give us an example of how such a design document can look like. What are the things there? Um, maybe using some example, not to make it too abstract. Uh, so I think that uh, it's very hard to say that there's one template which likes the best. Well, apparently the, 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 this template existed. Yeah, our book. Right, it's like it has the best uh, role. Yeah. You can't find anything. Yeah, now there are two design docs, two design docs examples, but they're following the same template. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you don't want to spend uh, like uh, uh, thirty bucks on our book, which is actually a very, um, uh, it brings me a lot of sorrow to, to, to find that out. You can just, if, if you can share the link to our book, what people can do, they can just read the outline because our book structure is built as a design doc itself. So every chapter is basically describes a chapter you would expect to have in the real design doc. So we discuss why it's important, what has to be there, what can't be there, and then we provide two examples. But basically you take an outline, it's already kind of an example of the design doc itself. So it has, um, well, again, it depends. So for example, 
we were thinking about having 16 chapters and then appendix, but then it turned out that appendix would be as big as the book itself. So we decided to keep it for a second book. But basically, you, you can go there. You you can you can find out you can find out an outline like is there a problem Prelim, pre, preliminary research design document lost function and metric gathering data sets validation schemas baseline solution error analysis training pipeline features and feature engineering reporting integration reliability and monitoring serving and inference optimization ownership and maintenance. So you see, like all basically, the thing some of these things were already discussed, like even ownership and maintenance uh, is a maintenance and maintenance. Maintenance, I guess, uh, are the part of whatever <laughs> are the part are the part of this design document, right? Integration, but so and uh, basically, there are sixteen chapters. Uh, every four chapters um, grouped into aggregated parts, like part one preparations. Part two, early stage. Part three, intermediate steps. Part four, integration growth. But obviously, you can add another another chapters. For example, like you could say, oh, we need to add a module on the fairness. It's, it's actually something we were hoping to uh, to to cover in in the appendix, but in turn out we already wrote too many words. And uh, because the book has to be between 100 to 120,000 words, uh, and it's already uh, too, too, too big for, for appendix. But maybe if the book will be a successful one, uh, then uh, we'll see, we'll see uh, if the second will come. Okay. So keeping my fingers crossed. And yeah. yeah. But. Um, so my question was also a bit of, uh, so what I was struggling with sometimes uh, is maybe having some examples. I guess right now, like if somebody wants to have an example, you mentioned that in the book there are two examples. And I think we also talked about that with Arseni, who is uh, Valeria's co-author, like a month ago, slightly more. Um, so yeah, maybe we can talk about an example, but also think like, how things could go wrong. And uh, like, do you have, maybe in your practice, things went wrong? I assume they did, right? And maybe, um, like, what was the reasons? Like, was there, oh, yeah. 100%. So in our book, we covered that in the chapter on reliability and monitoring mm -hmm. and, and the fallbacks. So basically, it doesn't matter how good your system is, it will go down sooner or later. Google went down, Facebook went down, AWS went down, uh, Twitter uh, is going down, <laughs> uh, Twitter went down. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, but you know, like just, just this weekend, Twitter has a lot of issues with uh, rate limiting and uh, uh, apparently it dosed itself so uh, well you there are, let's say that there are many things which might go wrong in a ml system so there are two things you can do you can monitor what's going on is it a data drift is it an error in the data is it a concept drift is it a prediction drift or whatever and the second question is, how could you react to that, right? You might have a, a fallback, which basically, let's say, your model went crazy, but you have some other solution, which, which is worse than model, but better than nothing. Uh, so it, and, and if you have it, you can, you can fall back to that solution, but you can only do that if you know that your model went crazy. In the first place, right? If you don't know that something's wrong, you can't react. So, uh, so basically, we we covered. Uh, we spent thirty pages writing what might go wrong, how to detect that, and uh, how to react to that. What I can, 
another thing I can suggest to people who are interested to this topic, there is a, a website uh, called Evidently AI. I'm just writing it to you in the chat. Uh, basically, uh, it's a startup or a company which, uh, uh, no, I, I, let, let me find it evidently. It's evidently AI.com, I think. Yeah, oh yeah, evidently AI.com. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So evidently AI.com. So basically what they have, they have a, a library framework for monitoring and uh, for monitoring, so model quality, data drift, target drift, uh, uh, data quality. So, and they have a very comprehensive set of blog posts and articles, which you can read because, well, they, they can tell you what might go wrong, how to detect that, and some basic stuff you can do to react to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the detection detection is the first step because if you can't detect that that's that's that, that's it finish it reminds me that we had helena one of the co-founders from evidently like two years ago and the title of her talk was why your machine project will fail where she outlines pretty much describes pretty much what you said but i'm wondering so monitoring is important and we have heard most of us have heard that probably. And I'm wondering, okay, we know that we need to monitor. So we need to have a fallback solution and we need to know that our machine learning model goes crazy. So we can actually fall back to our... Let's say that it, it, it might it, it might be a model problem. It might be because we mentioned four things. Yeah. So data quality, model quality, constant risk prediction, like the, there are yeah. many different things. So how do we account for that in the design phase? What place should these things have in our design document? And how do we actually structure them? So uh, I think that, well, we, 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 we think uh, that accounting for that is a part of, uh, it, it's, let's say, if we split the design into four parts, like preparation, early stage, intermediate steps, and integration growth, uh, we think that, uh, uh, reliability monitoring and fallback is the integration and growth, right? Because like, uh, it, it's definitely not a preparation. It's definitely not an early stage. Uh, it's even not an intermediate steps. It's like something, you already have a system, it works, it has a pipeline. So now you'd like that to be reliable and you'd like to have a fallback. So it's basically the, 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 your, your, your whole uh, focus at the end is on reliability. Like remember, efficiency, Redundancy, right? Reliability to some extent is redundancy uh, because like you might have three different fallbacks depending what is broken, right? Because maybe some data is damaged, but you have like a set of uh, three critical features and they are not affected. You still might have a model which is uh, much less sophisticated, but still better than let's say two if statement. If data is completely affected or corrupted, let's use three or two if statements. If, if, if even that doesn't work, let's use a constant uh, um, placeholder, right? So, uh, and you see, you have four solutions. You use only one, so there are a lot of redundancy, but a lot of stability and reliability. But yes, that's something that has to be addressed and which becomes, if you think about that, like the whole... Uh, uh, if you take a look, at, well, at least in, in our part four outline, reliability and monitoring and ownership and maintenance is all about these uh, fallbacks, what might go wrong, because it might go wrong from technical side, it might go wrong from people side, uh, how to take this into account. Okay, so I want to summarize everything we talked so far. So we started by discussing a design document, a machine learning design document, saying that we need to document there what we need, what we want, right? And then we started talking about why some things might go wrong. And one of the things, one of the um, things we need to keep in mind is that it has to be a dynamic, dynamic thing, a dynamic document. It's not a static thing. Then another thing we mentioned was that 
we should know who is accountable for what. So if there is no accountability mentioned in the design document that nobody knows what they are responsible for, and then nobody uh, will keep the document updated. Right? Worse than that, worse than that. It's not like nobody knows. People think wrong. People think, oh, somebody yeah. is responsible for that. And this person thinks, so this is even worse than that. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Then we need to think about that and explicitly mention, explicitly document who is accountable for what. Then another thing that uh, we need to keep in mind is that it should be, it should have, the document should have some sort of modular structure. It should have chapters and we should know when each chapter, when each model was updated last time. So we know how outdated the document is in general and how much effort we put into maintaining it. Right? So that's another thing. And then at the end, uh, towards the end, we discussed that we forget to Sometimes we forget to think about monitoring and there are many things that might happen. So we need to account for that too, but maybe at a later stage, uh, right? Or growth stage, or I don't remember the, the one before that, like integration stage, right? Like basically at some point we will need to think about that and we need to keep that in mind. Did we not talk about something else, something that is equally important to these four things? Look, uh, it's a hard, everything is important, right? Because every project is uh, quite unique. Uh, so for example, one common pitfall uh, probably both uh, you and I saw is that people trying to do something complex and sophisticated instead of working with a simple baseline solution, which can help them to test their hypothesis, to iterate very quickly and to see uh, what is uh, like an extra mile can bring, right? And you know that people, not that many people do that. And that's extremely important to build a baseline solution. But if you don't build a baseline solution, it doesn't mean that your project will fail, but you might spend an extra three months of, uh, of work, which is uh, probably not great. So hard to say, like, what is, uh, it, it, let's say that. We decided to focus on these 16 chapters uh, because the, we think they have, important and uh it's not like some of them we, we obviously haven't gone through through all of them because it'll take longer than an hour uh but uh, what i suggest you guys just uh, take a look at an outline it's free to look at uh, you can then further dive into a, any specific topic you'd like uh, uh we already have spoken about evidently ai.com where you can dive into the specific topic of uh, reliability and monitoring. Uh, and uh, just uh, as soon as you have this idea of these chapters being important, then you can start digging further into them and discuss them in, in your own design documents. And by the way, so while we were speaking, I went to our previous conversation with Arseni, who is the co-author of the book, and I found out that we have a discount code for the book. So I included the discount code in the description of this episode. So I think it's like 35%. So feel free to use it if you want to buy the book. Yeah. And then I want to ask you one last thing. So we okay. already about resources. So one resource, if somebody wants to learn more about ML systems design is obviously your book. The other resource is uh, Evidently's website. Is there anything else you would recommend um, for the listeners to check if they want to learn more about this topic? Look, I know that there is a channel, uh, a Telegram channel, but it's in, in Russian. It's, it's called Reliable ML, uh, mm -hmm. which... Uh, uh, and those people are working uh, as well on the machine learning system design course. They have a template. I don't remember if it's in Russian or in English, because if it's in Russian, then people who speak uh, Russian, people who speak Russian already uh, know about them. And it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to uh, tell about this to other people because it's in Russian, right? If it's in English, then uh, let me check. Now, let me just check uh, which which language uh, do they use because um, I just don't, don't remember. 
Huh. Is it reliable and reproducible ML, something like this? Um, no, yeah, well, don't ask too much. They just call themselves reliable ML. They don't call, call themselves reproducible. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm confusing them with somebody else. Okay, okay. So, okay, there is a template, it's on GitHub, and it's in Russian. From 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 yeah so no uh, uh, oh but, but oh by the way they have some materials uh, at the bottom and uh, they have some links to like ML design template from ML engineer interview so maybe an 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 article design document for ML models uh, on Medium in English okay so yeah you you can add some of these links uh, I, I can share it with you. Please send yeah, yeah, yeah. them. Google include them in the, in the description. And um, if somebody wants to get in touch with you and ask something, what's the best way of doing that? I think that the best way is go to LinkedIn mm -hmm. and um, ping me there. Uh, and I'm always happy to chat. Uh, well, depending on what, what do you want to ask me, right? But in general, yeah. uh, I'm I'm very open for okay. chatting. Okay, thanks Valeri for joining us for the second time. It's always a pleasure speaking with you and maybe as you mentioned at the beginning, as you join a new company and you encounter, you will solve new challenges. It will be pretty interesting to talk about, to discuss these challenges with you at some point in the future. So you're always- Hopefully, open. hopefully, hope so. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Thank you so much for for invitation and have a nice day. Yeah, and thanks everyone for joining us today too. And have a nice day and the rest of the week. And yeah, see you soon. Goodbye. Take care.